In Oregon's southeastern desert, a vast canyonland attracts more visitors, more threats from development, and more calls for wilderness protection. It's not just the forest land that's special. A new generation in a remote Alaskan village looks to modern technology and green ethics to build a sustainable future. We have tried to be a model community here. Growing a new kind of crop for biofuel, the promise of algae for renewable energy. And this fish climbs waterfalls in Hawaii, a feat like humans climbing Mount Everest three times. The fish have no problems climbing them. We're gonna find some birds. Our journey starts now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Bruce Burkhart. And I'm Caroline Ravel with some terrific stories today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, and wildlife, and about the people who are dedicated to protecting those resources in the areas where they live and work. Today we start in Oregon. Many people don't realize that much of that state is an arid high desert landscape. And in the dry southeastern corner of Oregon, there's a wild and spectacular canyon land carved by the Owyhee River. It's a place some say need urgent protection from growing threats as more people discover it. In today's day and age, it's really hard to find a landscape that's untrammeled by man. A place where you can go almost hundreds of miles in any direction and still have an intact landscape. Every time you're here, you see something different. In these wide open spaces, there's a sense of awe, and it really, truly never does get old for me. You know, you can get solitude out here. I can always find some place where there's nobody else. Sometimes a trip to the desert can be life-changing, and it lasted two or three days. But in a way, it lasts forever. The Oahe Canyon lands are the centerpiece of a huge chunk of real estate that actually involves three states. We're talking, you know, probably close to 10 million acres. My name is Julie Weichel, and I'm a recently retired large animal veterinarian. There's about 2.1 million acres of it right down here in the southeast corner of Oregon. I've been coming to the Owyhee country for about 55 years now. Oh. Gained a little weight since the last time she wore this saddle. <laughs> Big chunks of intact ecosystem are becoming increasingly rare in the West, and this is one of the last and certainly the biggest um, left in the lower 48. And that's important for some kinds of wildlife to have. Every way you access this country has its own challenges and, and its own rewards. Um, if you've got a good horse in the rocks, they actually are having fun. This hillside's pretty much solid rock. They have as much sense of success in the far side of a rock slide as, as you do, I think. This is not where you take your Sunday afternoon ride. <laughs> To get here is a, a major effort. Uh, it's pretty game rich. Um, it's a big landscape, and you know you can get solitude out here. My name is Walt Van Dyke. I'm a retired fish and wildlife biologist and an avid sportsman. There's a lot of different species in this high desert country, and the, the, you know there's a lot of antelope, pronghorn antelope, of course bighorns here in Leslie Gulch. Sage grouse, another key game species, and uh, oh, a little bit of quail. This chunk of southeast Oregon, the Owyhee country, it hasn't been fragmented. Um, you know, we don't have, as of yet, haven't had to deal with oil and gas development. You know, it's only a spot. 
on the ground, but it has far-reaching, possibly, implications based on what you do in that hole. Uh, it's, it's, it just fragments the habitat so nothing can live out there. A lot of this desert country, this sagebrush country, is more fragile than you think. See, it, it, it's really, look at that. It's, uh, you know, and this real loose, a little bit of roots in there, but not much to tear it up. You could take an ATV right up this ridge. You get up on these tops, uh, there's just no limit to where an ATV can go. And uh, unfortunately, people abuse that. And they're taking them off the roads, they're creating new roads. It's also a real good way to introduce noxious weeds. One of the worst parts of having them out here is the weeds that they bring in on their tires and as they get off the highway. My name is Jean Finley. I am a botanist retired from the U.S. Bureau of Land Management after 33 years. The Oahe area is full of spectacular geologic scenery. I don't think very many people know about this Oahe country. You can see how spectacular the weathering is through here. I think the word's got to be put out that it's not just the forest land that's special. These tall bushes here are 50 to 75 years old. To some people, sagebrush seems boring. To me, if you know where to look, you can find many different pockets of these unusual pieces of vegetation. I think fire is an enormous threat to this country, and we have to figure out a way to be on the spot when fires come. I think grazing is still an issue in some of the areas. I think grazing can be done in this country, but I think grazing needs to be done right. Should it be declared a, a wilderness area? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt that tracts of land all through this country should be wilderness. That would provide many of the protections that are needed. Wilderness is a way to protect it, but what I'm really worried about is the other 50, 60, 70 percent of this watershed that doesn't qualify as wilderness. What's going to happen to that? And I'd like to see the rest of it in some kind of a, like either a national conservation area designation or national recreation area designation. To just hope that people won't notice the Owyhee country because it's been historically hard to get to is, is naive. It's too late. It's already happened. I think that people are concerned about their way of life. Uh, these are people that have been here for six generations, some of them. My name's Chris Hansen. I'm the Owyhee coordinator for the Oregon Natural Desert Association. So the Oregon Natural Desert Association has identified 2.1 million acres within this area that are deserving of some form of permanent protection. And I think that the biggest challenge for us and our biggest goal is engaging the public, engaging people in knowing this place is here and knowing it's valuable. Even if they just go to the edge and look in, it's a place that has that value to all Oregonians. Um, and it is a sort of treasure, a sort of state treasure for them. The main point in which we're looking at is to continue to keep this place the way that it is. Now we head to Alaska, where a remote village is transitioning from diesel fuel to solar and wind power. The people there are proving that renewable energy is fast becoming a viable and cost-effective resource in the land of day-long nights and frozen tundras. We partnered with Earth Justice to visit the village of Iggy Ogig and meet their visionary leader who showed us how it's done. Igiagig sits amongst an archaeological district, so we always say our people have been in the area since the beginning of time. The village used to be over there. When I was young, really young, we used to have a lot of snow and it was colder than it is now. We're going through a pretty trying and difficult time in our lives right now here in Alaska and in the Arctic. In terms of climate change, literally our people have been talking about these experiences for a very long time. 
very expensive to get food up to these villages. There's no roads. Everything has to be flown in. Fresh vegetables are hard to come by. For a village of young leaders, and we've done a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Just realize yourself as part of a greater whole. And maybe the world will do whatever works for them, but we have tried to be a model community here. This is the Quijack River. The Quijack River is the most special river in the entire world. It flows from Lake Iliamna, which is the largest freshwater lake in Alaska. Most of the residents in Igiagig pack their drinking water from the river to this day because the water is so pristine. My name is Alexana Salmon. I'm 27-year-old tribal administrator of Igiagig Village Council. <laughs> We're close to 70 year-round people. And a lot of our people travel, so right now I think we're missing four people. <laughs> we design our own roads and build them, cradle to grave projects. We also have the largest salmon run in the world coming up the river, that's sockeye salmon. Igiagik gets a lot of tourists. We have 24 commercial operators that use the Quijack River. Four or five establishments that are based in and around Igiagig. Most people are here for fishing. The Quijack River is known for the rainbow trout and salmon that we have. He has a lodge about 15 miles over that way. The next big lake over. Alaska's not like it was when I was young. You get more and more people coming in for tourists. These bugs don't bother me. It's, it's those doggone no seams. My name is Randolph Alvarez, and here in the village, I'm the vice president of the uh, village council. All the villages in the region burn diesel to generate their electricity. Presently, we spend a lot of our resources on buying diesel. If we had other means to produce electricity like wind turbines or hydro, we'd be spending a lot less of our budget buying fuel and we could spend that money on other things. Diesel fuel has tripled in price in the last decade. So we have people who are literally living in energy poverty, people who are paying six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month just to electrify their house and heat their home. And that's not sustainable. The folks in EIG are actually well beyond you know, the idea of we should do something, and now they're really working hard to test some of these technologies. The, uh, the solar collectors will generate heat from the sun and run through a buried copper pipe to a hot water heater in the house. My name is Carl Hill. I live in Igiagic, Alaska. It's a really tight home um, and really well insulated. You know, these walls are a little thicker than some of the standard two by six. So. How long do you want to stay here? One year, three years ago. <laughs> What makes Igiagic special is some motivated individuals that just keep looking for new answers to some of our energy problems. Before, when they looked at Igiagic, they said, we really don't have a wind source. And then I'd look around, we'd have major wind storms. So I was like, we do have wind power. The greenhouse is powered by three wind turbines. With the lodges, there's really good partnerships with them to sell produce. That is a head of cabbage. Yeah. We just picked our last cauliflower. It's enormous. So look at the condition of the tomatoes. The idea is it wouldn't make a lot of money unless it could ex have an extended season. So now we can heat and power this building for relatively cheap. These lodges, most of them are five star. They're serving gourmet meals. So we're feeding the wealthy, <laughs> <laughs> producing for the wealthy. There's no pressure involved. I think one of the things people don't recognize or acknowledge about traditional knowledge is that it is dynamic. It's not static. 
traditional knowledge is not only what I have learned from generations past, but all of the experiences that I have and that I pass on to my children and grandchildren. It's the way that we live. That's why we've been able to survive in the harshest of climates in the worst of times. I think we're seeing extreme shifts. The winters used to get colder and the snow lasts longer and the ice lasts longer than it is now. The Arctic is getting a preview of what could happen elsewhere in the world when oceans rise and the behavior of the ocean changes as a result of um, climate change. In the Arctic, it's bigger storms because of uh, less sea ice uh, and that causes coastal erosion. We live on water systems. We live in those places that are going to see more damage as time goes by. We're blessed to live the lifestyle we have out here, um, but there's this sense that we keep our river pristine, that we keep our environment clean because ultimately we'll hurt ourselves. What you have here is our recycling center. And so we started a strong recycling program. The reason this is important for young people in our future generations is it teaches them to be respectful of our land and our environment. I felt like I had the greatest childhood here in Igiagig. My sisters and I had moved and lived elsewhere and got an education and thought, this is where our kids need to be raised. We want them to have the same, if not greater, experience than we had. And that's why we've moved back. We're trying to build a sustainable village and we have this higher quality of life that we've self-determined. We have another story now on the emerging biofuels industry this time on the new advances in converting algae into a wide range of useful products, including oil. The algae is grown with byproducts from corn ethanol processing plants. To get a closer look at this next generation biofuel, we sent Bruce Burkhart and our crew to Iowa. In Iowa, where corn is almost a religion, a new faith may be taking root. This is algae growing out of solution. It looks just like a cornfield. We run the harvester. This is our harvester. It reminds us of a combine pulling off the algae. Algae? Isn't that something we usually try to get rid of? You can actually crack the code on actually growing and harvesting algae and getting this biomass. The applications for this biomass is really incredible. You can use it to feed animals. You can use it to feed people. You can take its very high value in proteins. You can use it to fuel your cars. You can get the oil out of that. So when you look at algae, that's why so much interest is in it, because it has such a wide application in so many different sources. In addition to its biofuel possibilities, algae is already being used in all kinds of ways you might not be aware of. Food products, baby formula, or nutritional supplements like spirulina. Algae contains the all-important nutrient omega-3 fatty acids. It's all about omega-3s, and the world is short omega-3s. They're long omega-6s and omega-7s, but they're short omega-3s. And algae may have the best ability to solve the shortage of omega-3s in the world at the highest quantity. Quantity, that's what they're trying to tackle here in Shenandoah, Iowa. In an unusual pairing, a traditional corn ethanol plant is supporting algae production, a next-generation biofuel. It turns out corn has what algae needs. A third of the kernel is starch, being converted into fuel, a third of the kernel is fiber, being converted into animal feed, and there's a third left. And all that is being today is being converted into CO2 in the atmosphere. So we could actually take that other third of the kernel that we're basically emitting into the atmosphere, capture it, and create a whole nother product around how we convert CO2, warm water, waste heat, and sunlight into algae. CO2, wastewater, and heat, all byproducts of producing corn ethanol, exactly what algae needs. And this joint project called Bioprocess Algae is the result of an unlikely partnership. This whole process has been serendipitous. Todd Becker, CEO of Green Plains Renewable Energy, a major producer of corn ethanol, and Tim Burns, CEO of Bioprocess H2O, a water treatment company whose technology has been used to get algae out of water. How to keep algae out of wastewater systems. We have a lot of knowledge, and that knowledge gave us the opportunity to bring it into how we can grow algae, and we knew that with our system. The heart of it is attached growth. We have a system in which we provide a lot of surface area 
for the algae, basically think of a condominium for the algae to reside on. And that condominium provides a lot of surface area, so we have a big mass transfer device, think of it that way. So on a typical open pond system, which algae is traditionally grown on, we would be about 40 times the surface area of a system. So it gives us a lot of opportunity to be more cost effective. Let's say an acre of land. An acre of land that produces corn today in the United States produces seven tons per acre. Our goal in these reactors is to get 15 to 40 tons per acre of product. And instead of a once a year harvest, algae is harvested several times a week. The idea of getting gas and oil from algae is really not new. In fact, it's millions of years old. All our oil today is ancient algae deposits, compaction of hundreds of millions of years of riverbeds and compaction of algae already. What we're trying to do is accelerate with the process and to what Mother Nature has done so effectively and start to industrialize it and produce by our process. The stumbling block is cost. But recent breakthroughs promise to reduce that cost. At the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, researchers have developed a technology that uses extreme pressure and high temperatures to accomplish in minutes what nature has done over millions of years, convert algae into oil. Still, to be cost effective, algae needs to be grown in high volume. And co-locating algae production with a corn ethanol plant might point the way. You basically can use free inputs, the sunlight, wastewater, warm water, heat, and CO2, and there's a lot of all of that available. And so if you actually combine all that, you actually take something that is really free and you're gonna create something with a lot of value. And in the process, they just might be teaching the rest of the world a new way to look at that greenhouse gas, CO2. Instead of a pollutant, it could become a product. If you think about the ability to utilize greenhouse gases and CO2, algae, in my opinion, is the only profitable use of CO2 currently on the market. So if you're able to profitably use that CO2 portion, that's going to give you opportunity to mitigate the rest of the CO2 emission. Reducing CO2 emissions while growing a renewable and sustainable fuel source that could mean less expensive gas. That is the promise of algae. It may be a while before algae dethrones corn in this part of the world, but as this remarkable experiment is demonstrating, there's no reason they can't get along. Now to our Science Nation report in Hawaii, where Miles O'Brien shows us an amazing animal a type of goby fish that climbs up steep waterfalls to reach its freshwater spawning areas. An amazing story of adaptation and evolution over time. So lots of big waterfalls and the fish have no problems climbing them. These are inching climbers. They thrive in the waters of Hawaii. They talk about a fish with an amazing life story. They hatch in streams and are washed out to sea. As juveniles, they head back toward land, facing a gauntlet of predators. Then, to reach the safe haven of their freshwater spawning area, they literally scale waterfalls. What would that climb be like for a human? When we compare to the size of the organism, it's actually like climbing Mount Everest three times over uh, in a very short period of time. With support from the National Science Foundation, Biologist Heiko Schoenfuss of St. Cloud State University and his team study these extraordinary fish. The goal, to better understand how they've adapted and evolved in form and function to accomplish such vertical feats. The inching climber is a species of goby fish. Check out its suckers. That's how it climbs the waterfall, by suctioning onto the rock behind. So this is an adult Cyceopteris stimsoni. We can see the enlarged upper lip and the suction cup that holds onto the surface. It uses an inching up climbing style, advances the head, attaches with the oral sucker, moves the rest of the body upwards, and then attaches with the pelvic sucker. Key anatomical features show how the fish has adapted to its life cycle. Schoenfuss says understanding how these highly specialized organisms have evolved has implications beyond just one type of fish. 
The challenge in our case is climbing waterfalls, but it can also be extrapolated to other species and whether it's a human-induced selective pressure, pollution or warming of waters, we can learn about how adaptation occurs over long and short periods of time. Shonfu studies lots of fish in his lab, but no winching climbers. They don't do well in tanks. But he and his team go regularly to Hawaii to study them. I would like to know more about uh, how physiology of the fish is related to anatomy. So how much muscle is working and you know, how harmonious the muscles are with the body movement. Shonfus also studies how fish in rivers like the Mississippi near his Minnesota campus adapt to chemicals in the water. He's particularly concerned about pharmaceuticals and other bioactive products that we humans let seep into our waterways. Trying to remove them from the water column, trying to keep those chemicals from going in the water in the first place is a really big challenge. Maybe not as big a challenge as the harrowing journey of the inching climber. Now that's taking evolution to new heights. Now, here's a quick look at a story from our next show. Wilderness is a uniquely American idea, valuing the wildest places in nature because they're wild. Thanks for watching. And remember, you can catch us anytime on thisamericanland.org. We'd love to hear your comments and ideas for stories you think we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation.